hosting today's program is Hella Dale. She is the Senior Fellow for Public Diplomacy here at the Heritage Foundation. And with that, we can begin our program. Hella. Thank you. Um, first of all, welcome to our speaker today, um, Grace Cannon Boniker. This book, if you all have had a chance to take a look at and pick up outside, Daughter of the Cold War, an eminently foreign named volume. She's had a, I mean, her, her, her life story is so long and so interesting. Um, but some of the highlights that I want to mention here in the introduction is her lifelong association um, with uh, Russia and with the former Soviet Union uh, at, the, at the highest levels of diplomacy, as, as I'm sure you all know. She's the daughter of the eminent American diplomat, George Cannon, and has had a front seat to history in that capacity um, throughout her childhood um, and early years to American politics to um, from World War II to the Cold War and the end of the Cold War and beyond. She uh, currently serves as the chairman of the board of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. Um, and uh, she has held many eminent positions, including um, the chairman of the, or chairwoman of the National Advisory Council of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. Um, she's a member of the Advisory Council of the Kennan Institute. She has served as a country director for the Winrock International in Kiev, Ukraine. And um, she is also the former president of Silvus Business Consultants, that's S-O-V-U-S, um, and she served as the founder and project supervisor of the Volkov International Small Business Incubator in Russia. And she's also executive vice president of the Alliance Between American and Russian Women. Now, the reason that we are here today is her new biography, um, uh, Daughter of the Cold War, obviously, um, which is her first book, I believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It is. Um, not her, her first uh, um, foray into, um, into the creative arts. Uh, she worked as a producer for PBS and produced an eminent documentary, The First 50 Years, Reflections on U.S.-Soviet Relations. And uh, she's also a professional photographer and was senior editor of A Day, of the, a Day in the Life of the Soviet Union. Um, so uh, Mrs. Wanaka is an uh, extremely accomplished person, I must say. I was quite overwhelmed going through her volume. Um, and what, uh, what, what I liked so very much about the book was that um, she's very personal in the way she writes. Um, she's, uh, you know, very at, at a level that many of us, I feel, can, can relate to. Uh, even though she moved uh, in, through events uh, of history at, at a very high diplomatic and political level. So it is really like getting a first-hand glimpse of, um, of, of, the, of the 20th century, and, and, and that is absolutely delightful. I, I was also really pleased to find that she uh, uh, grew up in Norway to a large extent, <laughs> uh, her mother being Norwegian. So um, having been born in Denmark, we had a nice little um, chit chat in our Danish and Norwegian native languages. <laughs> um, uh, I want to say welcome very much to the Heritage Foundation. We're so delighted you could come and please um, give our guests a, a round of applause. Thank you. You can hear. Thank you very much, Ella, for that lovely, lovely introduction. Um, and thank you for having me here. I think you accorded me a great honor speaking at this uh, with such a distinguished foundation. And I had never seen your, this building before, so this is wonderful for me. Um, it's also a joy to be back in Washington, where I, which is really second home to me. I graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School and also 
have lived here about five different times. I plan to talk a little bit about my um, variegated life, if you can say that. And I will also read two excerpts from the memoir, Daughter of the Cold War. Um, I'm really happy to answer questions, so after I do that, I hope you will have questions, and I'd be glad to answer them. Um, my book is about an improvisational life where very little went as planned. It's about being the daughter of a famous man, George Kennan, who seemed impossible to live up to. He expected girls to have fulfilling lives as wives, mothers, and hostesses, um, but not in public life. It's also about Russia and Ukraine, where I invested considerable emotional energy and spent many years of my life. And no less important, it's the story of a woman who graduated from college in the 50s and faced barriers that are almost unthinkable now. Um, as you know, George Kennan was ambassador to the Soviet Union and the architect of the containment policy, which remained our policy towards the Soviet Union for almost 50 years. He was an inspiration to me but also cast a big shadow under which I often felt insignificant. Uh, the son of a tax lawyer uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, his interest in Russia was stimulated by a great, great uncle, also named George Kennan. And I'm going to read you a section from the book uh, about this progenitor with the same name. Born in 1845 into a family of modest means in Norwalk, Ohio, the original George Kennan had to quit school and go to work for the telegraph company at the age of 12. Tapping out messages to all parts of the world must have honed his curiosity about foreign travel. So when a job was advertised in 1865, surveying Siberia for a possible trans-Siberian cable for the Russian-American telegraph company, this 19-year-old telegraph clerk submitted his application and was accepted. He had never been out of Norwalk. My father used to tell me this story, impressed by the adventurous spirit that propelled this relative forward against pretty heavy odds. The elder George Kennan made his way to Alaska, and then in August 1865, he boarded a steamer to Kamchatka. He spent two years traveling through Siberia by sleigh, by reindeer, and by skin canoe, this was before the building of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. In temperatures, it went down to 60 degrees below zero and very primitive conditions. He learned to speak Russian on the way. Uh, the western part of Siberia was at that point only sparsely settled, inhabited largely by various Asiatic tribes. As a result of this trip, George Kennan wrote a two-volume book, Tent Life in Siberia, Adventures Among the Koraks and Other Tribes in Kamchatka and Northern Asia. He returned to the United States and gave lectures about this trip in order to supplement his income. He, like my father, had an intense curiosity about the world he was discovering and also an ability to keep meticulous notes and card files. However, his Siberian exploration came to naught as the transatlantic cable was announced at about the same time, killing any prospect of a trans-Siberian cable. George Kennan next returned to Russia in 1870 to do a pioneering trek through Dagestan and the North Caucasus, a wild mountainous region virtually never traveled by Westerners. This trip led to more lectures and publications. He must have been a charismatic speaker because eventually he earned some sort of world record giving a speech every night for 200 consecutive evenings, except Sundays, from 1890 to 1891. In his articles, the elder Kennan was rather pro-Alexander II's policies, which led the Tsar and his courtiers to assume that Kennan would be a good representative for them in the West. The Tsar's government even assisted him in arrangements for a trip to survey penal colonies in Siberia. This journey, taken from 1885 to 1887, 
totally changed George Kennan's mindset. As he visited Siberian prison settlements, he was horrified, and he became a strong opponent of the Tsarist system of exile. He built a false bottom in a suitcase and risked his life carrying out the last letters to their families from prisoners who were sentenced to death or suspected that they would not survive imprisonment. He became close friends with some early Russian revolutionaries and a founding member of the American Friends of Russian Freedom. He wrote a series of articles in the Century magazine that grew into another two-volume book, Siberia and the Exile System. When I finally read this book, I understood how grueling those trips were and what unusual physical stamina he must have had. <clears throat> when the book on the exile system was published, the Tsarist government, at the personal direction of the Tsar, refused to permit George Kennan back into Russia. In defiance, my ancestor made one more trip to St. Petersburg, but he was immediately picked up by the police and unceremoniously expelled. When my father talked about the original George Kennan, it was clear that he felt an almost mystical connection with his great-great-uncle. I've rarely seen my father so pleased as when he, my mother, and I visited Tolstoy's home, Yasnaya Polyana. Uh, my father was ambassador at the Soviet Union at the time, so we were accompanied by two black cars carrying KGB agents, whom my father jokingly called his guardian angels. Um, Yasnaya Polyana, a small Russian country estate, had been left almost untouched since Tolstoy walked out in November 1910 and ended up dying at the nearby a stop of a railroad station. Fitting in with a mostly musty museum feeling of the house was a wizened old bespectacled man who greeted us. Appropriately, he turned out to have been one of Tolstoy's secretaries by the name of Valentin Bulgakov. When my father introduced himself, Bulgakov volunteered. Oh, yes, I remember your uncle. He rummaged in the shelves and pulled out an old guest book with crisp, slightly tanned paper, and we all looked in awe at the original George Kennan signature. Even the guardian angels stood respectfully silent in their black suits a few steps behind. The George Kennans shared a birthday, February 16th. Both played the guitar, and both loved to sail. The original George Kennan eventually married, but never had any children. And I know my father felt he was his spiritual heir. My father told me that the one time he'd gone to visit the older Kennan, the wife wasn't very nice to him. But her cold reception never dampened his affection for his great, great uncle. I feel that in some strange way, destined to carry forward as best I could the work of my distinguished and respected namesake, he wrote in his memoirs. Years later, when I received a visa, I also couldn't get a visa for three years, he nodded his head. Ah, you see, it's the Kennan curse. All my life, as my work took me back to Russia, Again and again, I felt this strange magnetic pull. Russia had always been and would always be intertwined with my life. <clears throat> After many years of working on a variety of, so and I'm now talking, I'm not reading. <laughs> After many years of working on a variety of cultural exchange projects, I started my own firm, Sovis Business Consultants, which advised American businessmen looking for products, partners, and projects in the rapidly changing Soviet landscape. As president of Sovis, I was proud to have organized a meeting with the mayor of St. Petersburg, Anatoly Sobchak. At the last minute, Sobchak was called away, and I was shunted off to meet with the deputy mayor, Vladim Vladimirovich Putin. I knew Putin came from the KGB. A compact blonde man with with chilling eyes walked into the room. We were alone. All I could think of was how I would never want to be interrogated by him. If anyone had told me that I just had a face-to-face -face meeting with the future president of Russia, I would have thought the person delusional. In fact, I was annoyed at meeting with a deputy, 
and he was annoyed at having to meet with a woman, particularly an American woman. So that was, we did talk though for about 25 minutes in Russian. Uh, he didn't speak English at the time very much, and, or if he did, he didn't want to speak it. I, mean, I never was quite sure. Um, so it was an amazing experience. Um, <clears throat> concurrent with running my own consulting firm, I'd become vice president of the Alliance of American and Russian Women. This organization pioneered in um, competing for and receiving a USAID grant for um, to organize a, the first the first small business incubator in a provincial Russian city named Volkov. And this next excerpt is a little story from Volkov. Volkov life was primitive. There was no laundromat in town or washing machine in our apartment. Clothes were washed by hand. Newspapers appeared so irregularly that we often had no idea what was going on in the world. This was before the internet. Our television set had such a grainy screen that it functioned more like a radio with a lot of static. One day, I half listened to a grave account about the death of a princess, only to learn an hour later that they were talking about Princess Di. I wanted to kick the TV in frustration. It was a time of unpredictable and serious food shortages, so no one ever knew what would be found at the grocery store. Almost every food item was rationed, however, but when one took one's ration coupons to the market, the shelves were often bare. I wrote my children in September of 1998. Just arrived in Volkov, bitter cold, no heat, and rain, but the, warm of the warmth of the welcome definitely compensates. Imports have been almost cut off because of the banking crisis. Whole categories of foods and goods are disappearing. Many shelves are empty. <clears throat> the staff just bought the last bottle of mineral water for me. However, one can endure these privations for a few days. It's the rest of the population that's stuck with it. I nursed that bottle of water for four days and supplemented it with tea. Of course, in the spring and summer, it was the opposite. Our grateful farmers would come by with more bags of fruit and vegetables than we could possibly eat. To help the farmers, we launched an innovative leasing program, which was not a normal incubator service. At the time, our most farmers had no way of getting their goods to the big city. So the road from Volkov was lined with farmers' wives, each with a rusty scale, selling potatoes, onions, apples, and other local product out of worn buckets. Apple by apple, they sold their wares. Our leasing program allowed a local farmer to buy a truck with the cost to be paid over the next two years with money made from selling his goods at the market in St. Petersburg. It was about a three-hour drive from Volkov. Um, incidentally, we never had any defaults on those loans. Uh, the leasing business ultimately spun off to become a very successful commercial company that still exists today. As more and more small businesses set up shop in the incubator, we started to receive compliments. But on the contrary, one day, we had an inspection from a very important person sent by USAID in a special air-conditioned limousine from St. Petersburg. He spoke Russian, but was aggressive, rude, and verbally attacked everyone he spoke with, including me, until someone mentioned that I was Ambassador Kennan's daughter. He then made a total of about face and embarked on an oration about my father, for whom he had evidently been an escort officer in Berlin. In summation, he proclaimed, your father is my God. At my wit's end, I answered, well, I'm only the daughter of God. I began to go more frequently to the Soviet Union and then working in both in Russia and Ukraine. And on, this is really, well, during, before, and after Volkov. Um, I went to Russia as Senator Ted Kennedy's interpreter and aide. I was a founding executive director of the American Soviet Youth Orchestra, a senior editor of the photo album, a Day in the Life of the Soviet Union, and a producer of this 
the prize-winning documentary, which Hella mentioned, the first 50 years, Reflections on U.S.-Soviet Relations. I had the experience that my father regretted he never had, living in Russia side by side with Russians. He had been largely confined to the embassy and the regulated diplomatic life while I was spending days in an industrial town in the Leningrad Oblast. I admit to feeling proud when on Christmas Day 1999, the Soviet Union disbanded and I anticipated a more promising future for the Russian people. The door to living in a freer and more democratic society was just opening. It was a major revolutionary upheaval for which no one was prepared. Caught up in the general euphoria, I was surprised when my father made gloomy prophecies about how this transition had happened too fast. Later, when I saw grandmothers whose pensions hadn't come, standing outside in freezing temperatures, selling their precious household treasures just to live, I understood my father's prediction. But there were positive changes. Now we were friends again. Russians started inviting me to their apartments without fear of reprisals. We were able to socialize in public. Now there was freedom of the press, and hundreds of secrets from the Stalin era saw the light of day. Russians stood in line to buy the magazines to read these secrets of their own past. I continued to observe the transition from the Soviet Union to Russia from Ukraine, where I was sent by Winrock International to run a project on women's economic empowerment. I ended up staying in Ukraine for four and a half years, an experience that I will always treasure. In fact, I've had a lifetime of worth of wonderful memories of both Russia and Ukraine, and it saddens me to see those two countries engaged in an undeclared war. Similarly, I'm deeply troubled by the new kind of Cold War that's going on today. Although my book is finished, I fear that the conflict between this new Russia and my beloved America is far from over. Thank you. When I move down here. Yes, please. Right. Thank, thank you very much for, for your insights and, and your fascinating reading. Uh, I, I love the way that your family's association with Russia has this um, meandering uh, fade through through your, your, your ancestors uh, and even in the, in the records over there. That's, that's magnificent. Um, of course, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was your view of how <coughs> Uh, the relations, exactly where you finished, but uh, between the United States and Russia um, have evolved. Uh, and your view of developments, Russia is now apparently playing such a, um, an amazing role in our own politics, <laughs> certainly in the last election, and, and, and things have been very, um, it's been a very rocky path between us recently. What, what is your view of, of the state of affairs? Well, I think the state of affairs is poor right now. I mean, we're going through a very difficult time with our relations with Russia. I, um, I personally think they undoubtedly tried to interfere in the last election. It's just my personal feeling. But <clears throat> I also look back because I first went to Russia when I, w I went to a Soviet school the last year of the war. And we were World War II, that is, and we were allies. So I've lived there when we were allies. I've lived there. I, my father was ambassador during the Korean War. I remember going around Moscow, and there would be posters of American soldiers putting up poison in the arms of North Korean women. I mean, it was a very anti-American period. And yet, you would go in the street or the park, and you'd meet a Russian, and they would whisper, usually. They were afraid, but they would they would say, welcome, we're so glad you're here. I mean, it, it went completely against the official point of view. And I do believe that when governments, since I don't think war solves problems, uh, particularly not nuclear war, um, I think when governments are at a log's end, that it is a time when citizen diplomacy or cultural diplomacy or soft power, whatever you want to call it, 
plays a much bigger role. And I, I saw it myself. When we were starting with some of the projects I read aloud to you about, it, we were doing it because people just thought it was important to have some sort of contact and to break down the stereotypes that we are all looking at. I remember the um, youth orchestra. We had 100 musicians, 50 from the United States, 50 from Russia. We auditioned all over this country to get the best musicians. They would not audition. Theirs all came from Moscow Conservatory, which gives you a little you know, idea of the differences between our countries. <clears throat> but these kids who really hadn't known anything about each other, but they were all wonderful musicians. Um, when they came over here, they rehearsed at Oberlin. And when they came over here, the Russian minders that came with them um, said now that the one thing we don't want any Russians and Americans rooming together. We don't, you know, we want our Russians separate, et cetera. And so that first night at Oberlin, we had a big party. There was quite a lot of alcohol. And the Russian minders got kind of carried away with it all. And we then went and we put in a Russian and an American in all the rooms. And by the time they woke up in the morning, it was too late. They couldn't do anything about it. So they did <laughs> room together. And it was just amazing to see these kids. Most of them didn't know each other's languages. They all had little dictionaries. And they would be pointing to the dictionaries. It was, and, and our governments were really at, not at war, but they were definitely not going through a good period. So um, I think that uh, I hope this is a bad period, but I, we've been through other bad periods. I hope somehow that we will come out of it. How? I can't tell you. Right. Uh, Obviously, the kind of citizen-to-citizen -citizen diplomacy that, <clears throat> that you describe um, is what has been U.S. kind of policy for many years until um, Russia kind of for foreclosed that option for us when the um, prohibition on NGOs and um, uh, democracy uh, mm -hmm. promoting activities over there, um, which, which, is, which is certainly, certainly too bad. Um, and I wonder um, if, if you have any view, uh, how recently you have been back to Russia, and, and what atmosphere you sense. I was last in Moscow two years ago. Um, it was, uh, I visited sort of three sets of friends. I first of all, I visited the embassy to meet with our ambassador, who was a friend of mine, Ambassador Teft. And, and the embassy was really, they were really giving our embassy people a hard time. They were having a horrible time. And uh, sort of persecuting them in minor ways and following them and making life difficult for them. So that was a pretty unhappy group of people. Then I visited everything from some very bright young couple that wanted to emigrate. And they're going to be part of the brain drain that is going on. I mean, they hated it, they didn't like Putin, and they didn't want to stay there. They just felt they couldn't. And uh, they'd worked for, uh, she was actually working for the World Health Organization. So they had a different view of things. And then I met a very successful American lawyer married to a Russian, and, and they have what I think a lot of people in, in Russia have. They just have cut themselves off from the political life. To them, it's the culture. Isn't the culture wonderful? Yes, it is. We can go to the ballet. We have wonderful theater. We have wonderful symphony. We have opera. I mean, they live kind of in a world that is detached from the government, mm -hmm. if that's possible. So I met all different kinds of people in that short trip. I, mean, I was only there a week. And I, I, um, I'm sort of hoping that I can get my book published in Russian. And we'll see. Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah. Be interesting to see if they'll publish it. Yes. <laughs> um, if I could, if I could ask you perhaps uh, to reflect on on your illustrious father for a moment, since I know that many people will be interested in your um, uh, in, in your your feelings, your your views, your impressions of of 
um, of, of the men. Um, is there, what, what is there about George Kennan we, we should know that we don't actually know? We know something about, a lot about his great, um, you know, intellectual achievements and in influence on, on the Cold War, but as, your, as his daughter, what? Well, it's always hard to talk about your own father, I think, <laughs> although I've done it quite a bit, but it never comes easily. Um, well, my father had a lot of traits that don't show. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He was very mu musical. He um, drew for years. He wouldn't go anywhere without a sketchbook. He was drawing everything. He had a little bit of, I think, one of the things that made him into the intellectual success that he was, was, was this business of taking notes and card files. He was absolutely extraordinary. In our house, we had a whole wall of card files, and he kept track of where every Soviet general, general so-and-so, has been moved from Tashkent to, you know, Astana or something. And he could often see trends, because he had a computer like mine before there were computers. And by following all this, he saw trends that other people didn't see, because he was focused on the minutia, the detail, as well as the big picture. And the minutia led up to the bigger picture. And when he was, he thought one of the reasons that he was declared persona non grata, and that's a long story by Stalin, was that all the other ambassadors, when he was ambassador, would come into our embassy to talk to my father to find out what to say so they could go back and report it to their countries. And this annoyed the Russians a lot. And you can always tell it's an ambassador because he has to have the flag flying in his car. And so when an ambassador drives in, you can see it visually. And our embassy at that point was right across from the Kremlin. So this was, I think, particularly irritating. Um, and um, he was always fa he was fascinated by Russia. Mm -hmm. But he was also, he spoke fluent German. He was very interested in Germany. I mean, it, it wasn't only Russia. Yeah. As a child, were you aware how amazing your childhood was? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think. Um, I didn't know how else to live. Right. But um, I did go to this. I never went to the same school twice until I was in the 11th grade. We moved almost every year in some were this kind of schools. And one, my first grade, I was in Norway and Norwegian. Um, when I studied in Russia in 1944, I was in the fifth class in an ordinary Russian school, school number 131. And um, there were no other dependents, because it was the last year of the war. And there were no wives and no dependents. They, we had gotten to Russia only because um, <clears throat> they couldn't get us back to the States. We were in Portugal. And um, so since they couldn't return us home, they had to do something with us. And they finally got permission from the army, and we went across North Africa. So I've heard we were the first women to go across North Africa, but I don't know. It was my mother and my sister and I, and we went. It took us 13 days to fly from Moscow to Lisbon. By We'd get little hops. You know, we'd go from Tunis to Iran or something. Then you'd spend two days on an airfield, and then in the middle of the night, they would come and say, your plane is leaving. And they were all camouflaged, and you didn't have plane seats. You, we sat around the edges with tanks and military equipment in the middle of them. And um, that's how we made our way. And then, and then finally got to, you know, we went up through Baghdad and Tehran and Astrakhan and all these places. So it was, um, it was an education, but of a different sort. And when I went to this Russian school, I did not speak a word of Russian. So I just sat there until I finally learned Russian. <laughs> That's it. In my memory, which is, of course, faulty, um, it, I learned it all in one day. Of course. Of course. <laughs> After about three months, one day I was sitting there and I suddenly realized I understood. Right. Or I was beginning to understand, or I, mm -hmm. you know, I understood most of what was going on. 
And, um, and after that, I, I took the exams. I was called on in class. Mm -hmm. I mean, I became part of the, part of the school. And um, so it was a, a different experience. How was your Russian? It's pretty good. <laughs> I can speak mm -hmm. good. Let's open it up. Two questions from the, from our audience here. Um, uh, we have a microphone, and anyone who wants to ask a question, just identify yourself, please. So it's Jim. Uh, it's Jim Phillips. I'm here at Heritage Foundation, and uh, Mr. Putin is famous or infamous for saying there's no such thing as a, a retired uh, KGB officer. Uh, but that, uh, notwithstanding, how do you think Putin's Russia is different from? Soviet Russia, or, and, and how is it the same? Well, Putin's Russia exists at a, such a different time and place. The biggest difference that always strikes me is the internet. The internet has completely changed our world. I mean, the, to give you an, uh, the most striking example for me of how separated we were when, when uh, World War II ended, when we were there, um, Stalin did not announced the end of the war till one day after the war had ended all, everywhere else. And there was no leakage. I mean, these days you couldn't do that. I mean, the world is joined in some way. It wasn't joined then. I remember because I went to school and my father made me promise, don't tell anybody the war is over. You must keep this a secret. This is a big secret. <laughs> thinking, oh my goodness, is, I'm entrusted with this big secret. <laughs> and um, so, um, so he is existing at a different time. And while I, I thoroughly dislike Putin and disapprove of what he's doing, um, but he isn't sending people to the gulag. I mean, these people aren't being shot every day. I mean, it, the Stalin era it was so cruel, it was so horrible that um, it's, um, it's, you know, hard to think of it differently. Um, and I think a lot of people in Russia just sort of tune out the political stuff. They, they did even, um, when I first got to Ukraine, I, I really had a wonderful time in Ukraine, which sounds funny, but I didn't want to go. I first turned the job down. I just really didn't want to go live in Ukraine. And then they made this pot a little sweeter, and I went. And I was really glad I had done it. But, um, but the, um, wait a minute, we were back to your question of, of Putin and Well, it's, yes, it's, it's a highly, it's a dictatorship in a way, and they, he certainly controls the press, and particularly television. On the other hand, I thought it was very significant. Did, did you read in the New York Times the other day when, um, when the, um, he tried to muddle with, turn down, turn off parts of the internet, and all those kids came and demonstrated. There was a huge anti-Putin demonstration in red, you know, in and around central Moscow, and they were furious, and they had anti-Putin signs. Now this was just two months after the election when he won by eighty percent of the vote. So things are not as quite as one way as they look sometimes. I think that the kids don't watch television. The television is really stupid. I mean, it really is. I used to try and watch it in Ukraine, where we had mostly Russian television. And it, it was not very inspiring. It was kind of like the worst of our television, too. <laughs> very on a pandering to people's, not their highest instincts, I would say. So, I mean, I, I don't. I don't, I don't like Putin. I'm really sad about what he's doing. But, um, you know, that's, nobody stays forever. I mean, you never know what the next step is going to be, <laughs> if that makes sense. Well, it, it, certainly, it certainly does. Uh, 
he does seem to have um, be in remarkably good shape, though. <laughs> Oh, I think he's physically healthy. Yes, <laughs> which <laughs> be around for a while. <laughs> yeah, he's healthy, and he. Um, I, I think he drinks very little. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's a drinker, which a lot of Russians are. Now he is, um, as you described, having met him early, much earlier in his, in his career. Um, you you have crossed paths with so many well known. Um, politicians and leaders and um, just people on the world stage. Um, are there any, um, a few others that, that stand out particularly that, that, that you have some personal memories of that you'd like to share with us? Well, um, I did take care of Stalin's daughter. Yes. Svetlana Stalin. Hallelujah. Yeah. Um, for about three weeks on our family's farm in Pennsylvania. And my, when she defected in India the, and walked into the American embassy, they had no idea whether she really was Stalin's daughter. They didn't speak Russian. She spoke English, but it wasn't perfect English. And this woman walked in and said, I'm the daughter of Joseph Stalin. You can imagine the embassy just <laughs> sitting there saying, oh. And so the, I think it was the CIA flew her to Switzerland, and they flew my father. They decided he was the perfect person to interview her to ascertain whether she really was Stalin's daughter. He did say she was Stalin's daughter. Uh, and then she was going through a kind of religious phase at that point and told my father about how she was looking for, for peace and tranquility and back to nature. and. So Alana had sort of enthusiasms, and right now that was her enthusiasm. So my, we have a farm in, of all places, East Berlin, Pennsylvania. But um, he said, well, you can always go stay at the farm. Well, she didn't want to. She had other plans. But then her other plans, like all of her plans and in a very tragic life, they always ended up falling through because she always ended up like fighting with people. She, she had a lot of her father in her, unfortunately. And um, so she called my father one day with no notice and said, well, I'm ready to come to the farm. My parents were going to Norway. It was summer. And my mother always went to Norway in the summer. And it was, she wasn't, didn't care about taking care of Svetlana Stalin. And so I was asked to come. Um, my sister and I took turns, actually. and. Um, and so I did. I had two small children and three small children. And my sister added on giving me two children. So I had five small children and Svetlana Stalin. <laughs> and it was not at all the, I'm really sad that that happened that way. My, because it didn't give me, I could have had hours and hours of conversation with her. Instead, I was always in the kitchen or the grocery store doing something. I mean, I was. Uh, my father was very afraid she'd be kidnapped and killed. Um, that we, we had another Trotsky, so he made me promise that I wouldn't tell anybody. We would have nobody to help us. And so I was kind of by myself with this, with this job. <laughs> and um, she was a curious woman. She always reminded me of a horse with blinders on. It's the best way I can describe her. She didn't, she sort of looked ahead, but she didn't like to look sideways at all. She didn't see the things that were, except where she was focused. Did you and like your brother? Not that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, she had just left her own. Oh, she had. When she defected, she left two teenage, I think. One of them was certainly teenage. And uh, she was very annoyed. She was kind of irrational. She was very annoyed that the Soviets were taking advantage of her children. How dare they, she said. But what did she expect? No, it was not. Mm -hmm. not. And um, she later had an American child, Olga. And she turned on me, too. Uh, but then she came back one day. For a while, she wanted to be friends again. And so I got to see Olga. And um, all I could think of, it was very strange to see a five-year-old. She didn't speak any Russian. Mm -hmm. Svetlana wouldn't teach her Russian. Um, 
to see this five-year-old who was the granddaughter of Stalin. So it was kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. um, yes, come here. Um, I know when you were younger, you were skiing with your sister and your mother in Norway on vacation, and you got the and your mother got the call or a letter um, or telegram from your father saying to come home because the G the Germans are about to invade Norway. Um, I was just wondering how old you were at the time and what you remember feeling, and if you were very scared or if your parents didn't let on um, just just what all was happening <clears throat> at the time. No, they oh God, no, we were never told things like that. Okay. My father called up. My father was stationed in Berlin, and he, um, it was two days before the German invasion of Norway. And I was, oh God, six, seven, eight. I mean, I was little. And we had been up skiing in the mountains, and, um, and he told my mother that she needed to get on the next boat or train and get out of Norway. But he couldn't tell her why. That was he knew through government secrets or whatever classified stuff he he was pretty sure that the Germans were going to invade Norway, but he couldn't tell her that on the telephone. And my mother said, "Oh no, George, we're just having a lovely time." <laughs> and my father, who didn't quite know how to handle this, sent her a telegram saying, "I order you to get on the next. <laughs> I order you to get on the next." boat, probably. I mean, we lived in Christiansand, which, although I sort of remember it was a train. Maybe we took the train to Sweden. And off we went, and then we went to Berlin. So we were in Berlin when the Germans were occupying Norway, or fighting. I mean, there was three weeks of fighting that went on. So... Uh, and how, how long did you stay in Berlin? We didn't stay that long because um, he stayed for two years. He was, um, when the war came, he was in Berlin and he was interned. They interned all the American diplomats. And, um, and we, meanwhile, we had the German diplomats were rounded up here. And, and then the, after about six months, they were exchanged by a Swedish boat. The grips all went back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so we did come home, but six months later. Yeah. Well. Absolutely fascinating. I apologize, but I don't know when you, I remembered reading your father as I went through school and everything, but I don't know when he stopped writing, but was he writing at the time when we began the detente and we got friendlier with Russia? And during that period, how did he react to it? Was he pushing it? Was he telling people, verify and trust, but go ahead? So when did he stop having an influence, probably two days before he passed, and how did he go as when we headed towards the detente and so on, if you're still writing during President Reagan and his time? Thank you. Um. <clears throat> That's really a good question. Um, he kept writing almost until the end. He died in 101, and he was pretty much all there until maybe when he was 100, he sort of weakened. Uh, but he, he certainly <clears throat> he had strong ideas and strong opinions, as you probably all know. He was very prescient and very foresighted in the foreign policy arena, uh, domestically, he was very conservative. I mean, I don't think most people know that. It's not what we sort of advertise, but he definitely was a conservative. Um, yeah, he was not, as I put in my in the piece I read, he was not as enthusiastic about, he was not enthusiastic about the way the Soviet Union broke, broke up. He thought it was very dangerous. He foresaw a lot of the problems that, in fact, happened. And um, and we were, I said myself, I was all ex excited by it. I thought this was sort of going to be a new world for a while. Um, he also thought he was very much against NATO expansion, as probably some of you know. I'm 
he, he wrote articles against the expansion of NATO. He felt that <clears throat> for there to be NATO countries bordering the Soviet Union would lead to bad relations, which, in fact, it has. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Terry Baker. Um, I'm curious as to whether you've given any thought to um, what your father's uh, long letter may say today in advising American leadership and its relationship with Russia. Yes, I have given quite a bit of thought to it. Um, I, I saw the long telegram once they did, when he had its 100th birthday. Or they, they actually brought the I think it was a facsimile, but it was the long tem telegram, and they put it out over long, long tables. It was the longest telegram the State Department's ever received. Um, and I think it was written, he was, it was written when Avril Harriman was at that point our ambassador, and Avril had gone home on leave or something, so my father was there. And my father was... As the Gaddis book makes my father sound like he's always ill or something, he wasn't that way. But when he got a cold or something, he would then retreat in his room, and it was a very creative time for him. And then he would write. He wrote the long telegram when he was supposedly sick, and you know he was sick, but he wasn't deathly ill or anything. Um, and I think his he had a horror of nuclear war. After all, he lived, he was in Berlin at the beginning of the war, and then he lived in Moscow. We were in Moscow during the war. And right after the war, he took a trip through Europe, through the capitals of Europe. And he has written about it, his absolute horror at the physical and human destruction that the war had caused. And that was a big part of him. That's why he was anti, um, he was anti-war, he was anti the spread of nuclear weapons, it was for peace treaties when they could be done. And um, I, he really did have a, and that didn't leave him. And he could be indignant about foreign policy. I can remember going down to breakfast in the morning and my father was fulminating at the table. I mean, I, I would hate to think what would be happening today. <laughs> But he, he cared. He never stopped caring. So. Well, I want to thank you very much for, for taking the time to be with us today. Well, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> um, it's been a delightful conversation. And I hope, I hope you all get a chance to read through the book, because it really is a, a very um, Readable. It's very readable, it's very immediate, and you get the immediate impression of world events, which is the very best way to get them. So um, thank you so much. Really well, thank you, Ella. This has just been, I've really enjoyed being here, and I've enjoyed meeting all the people I've met. And I wish to everybody, it takes all of us to try and make this world slightly better. Indeed. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.